the development side, it came to a screeching halt. Then bad news feeds feeds on itself, and uh, all of a sudden, you, you, you know, every Monday morning, the, the the South Florida Business Journal, the Miami Herald, we go, oh man, you know, overbuilt economy, you know, the buyers are walking away, you know, instead of closing on their units, they're 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 leaving their deposits on the table, they're walking away, and it just became a cascading effect of more bad news begets more bad news. We kind of came to terms with the fact that this recession was going to be a really, really bad recession for an indeterminable amount of time. So we, we made a decision to close the company. Welcome to Conversations Around the Corner, where we talk to construction executives about who they are and how they got there inspiring the next generation of construction leaders. My name is Matt. And I'm Eric. Our guest today is Mike Neal, president and CEO of Cast Construction Company. Mike became CEO of Cast in 2011, shortly after the recession hit the economy in Florida. Cast Construction Company consistently ranks on ENR's top 400 contractors list. Mike is a graduate of the University of Florida and has spent his entire career in the construction industry. In our conversation today, we talk about the best rod and reel for fly fishing, road biking in the desert, reasons to come out of retirement, and what it was like living through the housing crisis in one of the largest construction markets in the U.S. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Yeah, what kind of bike you got? Oh, jeez. What what kind of a bike? A bike, yeah. He's got like four bikes. There's this kind of newer newer style of racing called gravel races in here in the Midwest. Yeah, I saw something about that. We don't have great roads and we don't have mountains, but what we have is farm roads. And, you know, with GPS units these days, they can just kind of release a file say, hey, this, the mass start is going to be at this time. And then there are these long races through country roads, pretty much. Wow. You know, I have a gravel bike that has like pretty much a road geometry, but big clearances for for bigger tires. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Where we are, we can get pretty good elevation changes out in those country roads. So it's kind of like these cool, long form, hilly races that, that we do around here. So oh, nice, nice. And yeah, it's like a cross between a road bike race and a mountain bike race. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's kind of right in between. So, oh, you you guys ride together? I don't I don't ride as much. It's uh, we have different forms of fitness in the morning. I yeah. tend to go to the gym. Matt tends to ride his bike in, into work. <laughs> so, I mean, he could beat me up if he could catch me. That's <laughs> that's probably right. that's right. So you just got to be a little bit faster than a guy that has a ability to take you on at a good uh, <laughs> judo match. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your father. He was in the construction industry, and he was a journeyman electrician. I grew up uh, in a in a what used to be a very small town called Hollywood, Florida. Hollywood is a little city that's kind of wedged between Fort Lauderdale and uh, Dade County. Great little town. Um, lived in a blue collar neighborhood. Uh, you know, great families. You know, we walked to school, and it was just a great sense of community. But my father, you know, was a journeyman electrician, hardest working guy I ever met in my life. And, you know, we lived in a very traditional family uh, environment where, you know, my mom stayed at home, raised the family, prepared the meals, took care of the kids. And uh, my dad was, uh, you know, a, a warrior. He just you know, went out every day and uh, did his job. And he was, a, he was a great guy. Now, growing up, did you, um, did you ever pick up summer jobs doing construction related stuff or did you have uh, different types of summer jobs? So growing up, uh, my my dad made it pretty clear to me that I was going to have to, if I wanted po- any pocket money, I was going to have to learn how to earn it. So I uh, I was uh, the guy who had a uh, mowed the most lawns in our neighborhood, you know, kind of a, a yard guy, you know, and and you know, I, for five dollars I would mow a half acre lot, edge it, you know, sweep it up, pull weeds. Uh, so I did a lot of that. Uh, had a paper route. And this was all before I was old enough to legally work. As you might expect, uh, that my father's philosophy didn't change as I got into high school. So uh, through his affiliation with the, uh, he was a union electrician. So he was allowed to, I think once I turned 16 or 17, bring me on the job sites during the summer to work with him. All right. You know, I was I was really pretty much just a, a hired hand uh, to do all the grunt work. He would hand me a a bundle of half inch pipe to 300 pieces of a conduit in there. And he said, I need you to bend this pipe in a 90 degree angle. And we're going to do it in the same place every time, you know, lifting heavy uh, electrical equipment up onto a roof. I was a slave, man. It was a, uh, you know, but I think that was his quiet way of trying to build a worth that work ethic in me to, uh, understand what hard work meant, you know, what you do to earn a good day's wage and, uh, and, you know, nothing in life comes easy. 
Yeah, sure. Do you think those early jobs were kind of what drew you to the construction industry later in life? I got to tell you, um, I wasn't thinking about what I wanted to do when I was out there working with them. I was, I was, you know, I knew I was making good money. And, uh, I, I think that there's a, an outside chance that building things, uh, and, and being part of a, you know, something you could tangibly look at when it was complete might've stuck in my brain, but it wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it in that moment. Yeah. How do you stay cool in the Florida summers working construction jobs? <laughs> I, I, I don't think you do. You know, I, I've been, th- I, you know, I think about things, you know, from time to time, you know, I go back and say, you know, how did I get there? How did I get to where I am? And what do I appreciate uh, about my life and, and the people who are in my life? But actually being a, a worker, you know, working with your hands out in the hot sun in the summer in Florida, it's a bear of a job. Yeah. It's hard. You know, you're, you're dehydrated. You're by, by the time it's noon, lunch break, you're going, man, I got to get out of here. I mean, it's, it's nothing but hard work. And these guys do this for 20, 30, 40 years straight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things that's, that's, that's happening in our industry. Not too many people want to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The physical comfort of jobs today versus jobs of yesterday are just kind of different. They, they are. It is different. And, you know, with the, you know, a lot, a lot of work is getting done, you know, behind a computer. A lot of work is, you know, a lot of jobs have become automated. Yeah. The reality is, you know, there is such a huge demand for skilled labor and unskilled labor in, in, in our industry, and I'm sure others. We've got to work somehow uh, of, uh, on, on, on convincing, you know, young people that, you know, if you don't go to college, you can still make a six-figure salary in our industry by by being a, uh, a you know, a skilled labor right. electrician, a uh, heavy equipment operator. I mean, there's a way to make a great living. Yeah. Tips and tricks for staying cool outside, like, or, or, or like, what types of things did you do? Do you remember like covering up or sunscreen or taking breaks to put cold water on your back or anything like that? Do you guys do that stuff or, or no? Are there, are there any special <laughs> like, like, Floridian tricks that yeah, you don't know in the Midwest? I guess, yeah, I don't, I don't know any of these things. <laughs> well, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that, uh, I, I don't think I've ever put sunscreen on, uh, <laughs> I grew up surfing and diving and, uh, you know, being out in the sun pretty much all my life. What, what I would say if, uh, if, if I had to make up an answer to that, I think it's just sort of pacing yourself and uh, uh, staying hydrated. You know, if you know, your, your body tells you when it's time to, to maybe go, go find a shady spot in a, in a, in a cool breeze and take a 10-minute take a break. I mean, if you live in Florida, a good tan is an important thing to have, right? So you can't use sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I'm... I'm not too terribly worried about my tan, but uh, I, I have I have uh, naturally deep olive uh, <laughs> a, a, Italian skin, so I'm not. Uh, that's never been my problem. All right. So, so you grew up being a, a beach kid. You would go to the yeah. beach and and swimming and hanging out and surfing. Tell us some of uh, those experiences and how they were formative. Well, I mean that was that was the way uh, most of the people that I grew up with and my family recreated. You know, my dad got off. Uh, work Friday afternoon. And, uh, he, he loved going down to the beach and, uh, spending the day with, with his family. And he, that's where he, yeah, we kind of got raised in the water. You know, he, he, that's where we learned how to swim. And then, uh, my dad showed us a little bit about, you know, okay, there's a few reefs out here and we'd go out diving and, you know, seeing all the coral reefs together. And, uh, then when we got a little older, he, he started taking us fishing. And, uh, you know, when we weren't at home or at school or at work, you know, we lived our lives in the water. Did your dad introduce you to fishing, uh, the salt fly fishing, or was he into a different style? No, uh, fly, I didn't really learn to, uh, I didn't really get interested in fly fishing until I was probably in my uh, uh, mid to late 30s. But my father, you know, he, he loved being on the water. And I remember... Uh, when we were old enough, he would take me and my brother down to the Keys and, uh, we didn't have our own boat, but he rented a boat down there and, uh, we would bottom fish for snapper and grouper. And it was just awesome. I couldn't wait for summertime to go down to the Keys. And if, uh, if y'all have, have never been to the Florida Keys, it, it's truly a uh, paradise. I mean, it's completely different from <clears throat> the vibe in Miami or Palm Beach County. It's, it's like being in the islands and it's just, it's just one of the most remarkable ecosystems in the world. So it sounds like you spent a ton of time with your dad. So you guys as a family spent a lot of time together. You got a chance to work with him. Yeah. What, what are some of the most important lessons that you learned from your dad that came out of your childhood? 
my my father, uh, you know, he was a, a depression baby. You know, he you know his his parents grew up super hard, and so he wasn't a a great philosopher. I mean, he was a a guy who instead of talking about things, he he did them. So I, I think what I think he really taught taught us the value of, you know, saving our money. You know, he, he built, he built our house. And I remember, you know, I was very young when he did that, but, you know, he was a guy that, you know, his, his hands and his ability to produce things with his hands. Uh, I, if he did ever philosophize with me, it was, it was really about, you know, working hard, getting up early in the morning, you know, give it your best. Don't be, you know, be the first guy in the last guy out off the job. That's, that's how he made his living. Yeah. You know, neither of my parents went to college. So he, I don't think either of my parents were really had the had the skill set to to really understand how critical it was to to get a college education and shaping our lives beyond the time we were in high school. But they they certainly gave us a great foundation, a great set of tools to to build our lives upon. Yeah. So you you grew up at the beach mostly uh, in high school, but you were also a high school swimmer and a good one at that. Can you? share with us how you became good at swimming and, um, and yeah, what was your, what was your best event? <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, we get to talk about my mom a little bit too. So my mom was the warden All right. who, you know, took care of us during the day while my dad was off at work. So I, I don't know how she what precipitated this, but uh, I just remember one day being dropped off at a pool with my little brother and uh, we were at that pool pretty much all day and getting, you know, started off with, with swim lessons. And then as we, we got older, then that turned into getting on a, uh, a non-school affiliated swim team where the, those practices became, went from one practice a day to two. And uh, then there were the, the weekend swim meets. And, uh, you know, I was a skinny little 135 pound kid that, you know, I was pretty good in the water. I, I was surfing before I swam. So I was pretty strong in that the swimming type muscles. I can't say that I loved it, but it, it, it became my, my routine. It became my, as I got into high school, it became the, the one thing you know, athletically that I was good at. I was not anywhere near large enough to play any contact sport. I would have probably been a cripple. <laughs> I probably discovered I was a little bit competitive. I had a, a swim coach in, in high school who was also one of my teachers and he, he was pretty inspirational. You know, he was the probably the one guy in, in my high school life that, that somehow was able to inspire me and, and, and maybe make me feel good about the athletic ability I had in the pool. And, uh, you know, he started working with me on specific events. So I was, I was not a distance guy. I was a, a sprinter. So my events were the, the 50, uh, 50 meter freestyle, the hundred meter freestyle and the, uh, uh, 100 meter backstroke. Okay. J- just for fun, he would, in some swim meets, put me in the 200 meter uh, individual medley, but that's all four strokes, yeah. which I, I hated that. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I couldn't, I sucked at breaststroke and I, I was no good at butterfly. So get me on the starting block and make me do uh, four laps in the pool and I'm, I'm going to give you a, a thousand percent uh, all day long. Do you remember specifically how uh, he was inspirational and how he was encouraging? Do you have a good, do you have a story around that? Uh, I, I, I do remember the guy's name. It was, his name was George Steves. There's a, a way about a human being when you encounter them that they're, they're just such a good guy. And, and he immediately earned my trust and he would, you know, take time to talk to me about, uh, not, not just swimming. I mean, he was one of these guys that, that would talk to you about a lot of things. He rewarded me. Like if, uh, he, he was one of these guys, Hey, listen, man, you, you show up to practice two a days. I, I know you like to surf. Uh, you could skip practice on Friday to go surfing with your buddies. Yeah. Okay. I said, dude, I'm all, I'm yeah. all in, you know, and, and everybody liked him. There was not a, a not a, a single member of our swim team who just didn't think he was a great guy and great leaders have the uncanny ability to, to bring out the best in people. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mr. Steve's just made us feel good about ourselves. I mean, he, you know, he certainly, if, uh, if he saw us slacking or, it, you know, he, he knew what everybody's splits ought to be when you're, you're in the pool. And if he, he sees you're just, you're not giving it your best, he's going to, he's going to say something to you about it, but he's not going to do it in a, in a way that that's demoralizing. Mm, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm personally, that's the way I'm wired. I, I mean, I'm a chemistry guy. I'm a person who, you know, I, I try to bring out the best in people through those same techniques that, that he used. I'm not a, I'm not a guy that's going to sit there and tell you how, how bad you're doing and, and beat my fist and scream and yell. I mean, I, those are archaic techniques for, for leading people. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so after high school, you ended up going to the University of Florida, and you studied building and construction there. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I did. Do you think your education at Florida in the building construction program prepared you well for the construction industry? I'm, I'm a guy who will readily admit that the education I got kind of determined the career path that I would follow. What I've learned being a, 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 a in the construction industry, most of what I've learned is is comes from being in this industry. And I, I, I don't think that I've used a lot of what I learned in college. I think college generally teaches people how to think and how you do in college is, is a result of how hard you work and how disciplined you are. But I, I've, I've learned more by uh, studying other great leaders and uh, great people that have influenced my life and relied less so on what I learned in college. If you were to go back and be like a visiting professor in the, in the same program and you could just instill wisdom that you've learned on the job, what would the course name be and what would you teach them? I think the course name would be that construction is a, uh, is a team sport. Mm. The construction industry is a service industry and therefore so much of what you do to achieve success, success is, is through interpersonal skills, less so uh, technical skills. Listen, the, the technical skills are clearly important. It's easy to teach people the technical side of the business, but the, the people who get elevated to the C-suite, if you're going to be successful, the, the people side of this business are way more important, in my view, than the, uh, than the, than the technical skills. I've always thought uh, the concept of a GPA is like a funny one, you know, like a one, one number that represents your academic ability, right? Yeah. I've always thought like it'd be funny if you had like a, a social GPA. <laughs> yeah. Like your ability to interact with people. How good are you at it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's everything. I mean, a hundred percent. If I had to pick uh, a, a new employee based on uh, how, how technically adept they are or how s socially adept they are, uh, I'm going for the guy who has good people skills. Did you have a, a group of friends that you felt like that you had like a, an education in like social group dynamics or is these things lessons you learned like on the job later on? I, I have to give you sort of two different answers. So, so yes, I, I do have, uh, it's funny, and I think it's quite rare, actually, uh, uh, probably 10 lifelong friends that I, uh, that I met when I was growing up in, in, our, in my little neighborhood of Hollywood, Florida. Many of us go back to elementary school together. Um, most of us went to high school and college together. We're in the same fraternity together. Mm. You know, we all were in different industries. One guy's a, a, a you know managing partner at Deloitte. Another is a big time attorney. Another one is a dentist, uh, and, and very successful entrepreneurial people. And they are still today absolutely bar none my 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 brothers, my best friends. Mm. I was probably the shyest person. Among, these are some massive large personalities. I think I'm actually yeah, a, yeah. an introvert and I'm usually the guy that's probably the least, you know, the quiet guy in the group most of the time. And unless I have a couple of, you know, rums, yeah. <laughs> the, the idea of, uh, culture and the, the critical nature of, of interpersonal skills didn't really kind of dawn on me as a concept until I worked for my, my first employer, a company named McDivitt and street, who's been, uh, bought and sold several times, uh, but uh, the main guy that, that owned the company was a, a guy named Bob Street. And this was back in the 1980s when you, know, you didn't hear a lot of discussion about culture and people business. But Bob was a brilliant guy who, who figured out how to build a construction company uh, around the concept of having a great culture. And you know, this guy was a marathon runner. So he, you know, he'd take a group of us out to you know, at lunchtime every day. We'd go run six miles together, uh -huh. come back. And, and he had this like 20,000 square foot employee cafeteria where every employee in the company ate free every day. And, and we were in there all sweaty and just talking about, you know, how, how'd you run? How'd you feel today? To me, it was it's sort of the same thing you see at companies like Google and yeah. Amazon. You know, it, it, it was the first environment that I've ever had where I go, man, what, you know, what is going on here? Why is this? Why do I love my job? And, 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 you know, I think back on it, it was, it was because of all the things he did and the culture he created. 
Um, so, okay. So you referenced your, your, your first job at school. Uh, do you have any, any good work stories from that job? What type of work were you guys doing? And, um, and then what did you like and dislike about it? I, I joined that firm in, in, uh, I want to say 1982. I was at the very, very beginning of my career. Uh, my position was a, it, it was the entry level position called a project engineer. So, so basically you were hired as a, almost a functional equivalent of an intern. And, and that's where you, you start learning the business from the ground up. So I, my first assignment was on a very small shopping center in Atlanta, Georgia. It had a, a crusty old superintendent on the job. And uh, I remember his name. His name was Jim Ussery. He was a, a country boy. And uh, I think he, he called me college boy. Uh -huh. And he, he, I walked on the job site the first day. He goes, let me see your hands. And so I showed him my hands. He goes, yeah, those are perfect fit. I go, you got, what, what do you got? You got some gloves or he goes, <laughs> no, see that wheelbarrow over there? <laughs> Grab it. And, and they, they, they filled it up with, it was filled up with dirt. And he goes, I need you to go take that pile of dirt and put it out in the, in the middle of that slab out there. I'm going, <laughs> he goes, is that okay? College boy. And I go, uh, well, <laughs> not, not, not what I thought I was going to be doing, but, uh, so that, that was my, uh, my grotesque introduction of my uh, leaving college with a bachelor's degree in construction. Yep. Over time, uh, we were a, a company that was building all over the country at that time. And I, uh, I was assigned to a gentleman named Tom uh, Stocksdale, who, who I'm still friends with today. And he was uh, my boss for about 15 years. And so I, I worked on a, uh, an account for a big developer called Trammel Crow building Wyndham Hotels pretty much all over the country. So we did our first hotel in, in downtown Atlanta. Uh, I had just gotten married in 1982. So I was there for about two years to finish that hotel. Then we moved to uh, Austin, Texas, Houston, Texas, Miami, Florida, Palm Springs, California, Indian Wells, California, San Diego. So that traveling gig I did was uh, where I kind of learned but, you know, and I grew in my position from project man, uh, project uh, engineer to assistant project manager to project manager to senior PM. And, and by the time you're, you know, these jobs are, you know, 50, 60, 80, $100 million, big, big hotel resorts. If you really look at it, every project is like a running your own company. You know, when you're the senior PM on a big project like that, you got P and L responsibility, you have uh, safety responsibility, everything I do today, as CEO of, uh, of, of this company, I mean, I was doing that on a, on a micro basis on multiple projects. So I, I feel like I really, really learned the essence of the construction industry, you know, during that 10, 15 year period where I was actually on site learning how to build, you know, and, and you know, you also learn a lot about people, right? Because you're dealing with hundreds of subcontractors, you're, you're, you're talking to uh, CEOs of, who who are the, your customers. You're talking to architects, engineers. That's where I really became fell in love with the construction industry because, you know, I got to build projects. I got to build teams. I got to build. Uh, I felt like I was part of building a, a great company. So it was a tremendous uh, learning experience for me. Who do you think in that that first experience was your your greatest mentor at that company? Well, I, I would tell you um, kind of the, the macro level uh, was, was Bob Street, the owner of the company. And I didn't, I didn't really interface with him that much, but, you know, I got acquainted with their culture when I was, you know, first hired and that culture never got diluted the entire time Bob was alive. Maybe once a year, he would get on his plane and, and fly wherever you had to, to, to go say hi to the people on the job sites. You know, he'd walk in the office, meet the top guy, the superintendent, the PM, and then he would walk down to my office and like, you know, I get a little nervous and, you know, he'd sit with me and we'd have a great conversation for about 10 minutes and then he would leave. And about a week later, I'd get a hand, personal handwritten note from Bob that said, hey, Mike, you know, it, it was so good seeing you and uh, I, I, you really need to know you're making a huge difference in our company. And over the years, I actually saved those notes because I never wanted to forget how good that made me feel. And, and, and today, you know, I, I use personal notes when I, you know, when somebody has a baby, uh, one of our employees does something wonderful, uh, I'll, I'll send a note to uh, 
uh, somebody's wife and say, you, you, you have no idea what a stud your husband is. You know, here's a little gift. Yeah. Take your husband out to dinner and tell him how much, how proud you are of him. Oh, wow. The personal nature of recognition was, was one aspect that, that I think Bob taught everybody in the company, not just me. Then my direct boss, uh, Tom, that I had mentioned earlier, Tom was a tough dude. He, uh, when he, I first met Tom and I first, you know, I got handed off to him. You know, he looked at me with a kind of a scowl on his face. He goes, I expect you to be the first guy here in the morning. I want the coffee on when I get here. You better not leave before me. So, so 15 years working for this guy, I, I never felt that I could do enough to please. Like I'm a pleaser, right? I mean, like I'm, I'm the kind of person that I want somebody to, to say, Hey man, you're doing a great job. I appreciate you. And I was so hungry for that. It wasn't until I had my first kid and I'd probably been working for Tom for about 10 years. I invited him over to my house and uh, we were having some barbecue on the backyard and he was ha- holding my daughter and he goes, you know, he, he looked at me, he said, Hey Mike, I, I want you to know how proud I am of you. And, and he goes, you're, you're, you're doing great things. And uh, what he did for me was show me the right way. You know, his standards were so high yeah. and, and so exacting and the pressure of fulfilling his his standards absolutely made me a, a better builder. Uh, I mean, he, he focused way more on the technical side of things and, and the risk management. And, you know, if you're going to be in a construction business, you better do it like this. And so he shaped that part of me, I think, technically. I always respected him, but I didn't like him too much. But now I, I think... I look back and I go, he, he probably gave me one of the greatest gifts uh, ever. And that was just by, by being demanding. I want to go back uh, a little bit and talk about Bob Street. So do you think people like Bob Street who are great leaders, interpersonal, need people like Tom around them? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think, listen, we all have to have uh, uh, different clubs in our bags. I mean, I, I'm, I'm generally considered a pretty uh, nice guy, but if if I need to put the leather to somebody and, and let them know that they are way off the reservation. Uh, a leader has to, has to have the courage to do that. I got to a point one time where I was looking at everybody's annual reviews. You know, you got uh, three or 400, you know, people that are getting reviewed every year. And I, you know, I spot check them and I go, how, how come everybody's getting like, you know, five on a scale of one to five on doing every, everybody here, there's nobody here has any need for improvement. So I sat down with all my leaders and I said, guys, do you think you're doing people a favor by, by being a coward and not telling them what they need to do to improve? Are you, are you making a difference in our company by just telling everybody they're great? I mean, if, if you don't give people feedback, and it doesn't have to be in an ugly or mean way, but if you don't have the courage to stand up and tell somebody, hey, there are two or three things I'd like you to work on next year, you're, you're being a lousy leader. So, so I think Tom, you know, was kind of comfortable doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And my other question about Bob street, how did he pick who got to go running with him? <laughs> did he just like, did it was an open invite? And it was like, Hey, I'm Bob. I'm fast. Can come <laughs> run with me. I don't know the answer to that question, but I know he was, you know, this was the corporate headquarters in Charlotte. Okay. So yeah. that's where Bob's office was. You know, we had 20 or 30 offices around the country, but I got to, to spend a few years in Charlotte and that's when I got my greatest exposure to, I would say the heart of the company and, and, and what, where all this greatness emanated from. So, yeah. uh, it was, you know, a lot of the people, you know, the, uh, CFO was, was in that group. There were a lot of the, uh, division managers and, you know, listen, Bob, Bob didn't, you know, say, Hey, it wasn't like you, 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 and you. It's like, hey, I'm going out running today. It's uh, it's it's 87 degrees, and we're gonna go. Uh, if you want to go, fine. If not, stay here and uh, you know, have a have a hamburger. My follow up question is: you were you're a decent aerobic athlete, right? You're a good swimmer. Uh, I w- I was. <laughs> okay. Did uh, you have to take it easy on him, or was he fitter than you were, or what? What was the dynamic on the no, run? No, no. Listen, by far, I was I was probably on the C team, but Bob, you know, Bob, <laughs> Bob was a, 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 I would, you know, anybody who could run multiple marathons, uh, you know, New York marathon, Boston Marine Corps, uh, he, he was an elite athlete and, and it just turned out that most of the, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I think back now, most of the C-suite people, uh, they were, they were very thin, about 100% of them were very good athletes, very good runners. Uh, some of them were cyclists. 
Bob was into it. And I think it, a lot of people just said, Hey man, this is not, not only is it smart to, to be fit, but you know, I want to be like Bob. Okay. Yeah. So he, he, so he was the one pushing the pace. It was no, but no, you didn't have to dance around a dynamic of like not going don't, too don't hard beat, on don't him. Don't yeah. beat the boss. Don't beat the boss. Uh, well, I would, again, like I said, I, I was, I, I wasn't able to see people's faces from where I was. <laughs> uh, I was looking at their backsides, but uh, I would, I would, I would, you know, I'd be, you know, right in there with a the pack. All right. So you grew up on the beach and then you had these uh, two year assignments in the middle of the desert. What did you do with yourself there? Actually, uh, the desert was where I, uh, I, I learned how to cycle. One of the guys that um, worked for me, uh, a young, a young uh, probably an entry-level guy from Dallas, uh, you know, showed up to, to the job site with this really cool road bike. And I go, man, that's, that's nice. He goes, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. You ought to get one. And I go, how much do they cost? He goes, you can afford it. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I bought my first road bike, and uh, it was in Palm Springs, California. That was a great place. You know, the traffic was pretty, uh, pretty low. The uh, we had some great hills. Yeah. So I, I, I did that, and I, I think that's where I did uh, my first century ride. Was uh, out out in the desert. The most memorable ride was uh, there was a race. You guys probably have heard of it, uh, from Rosarita to Ensenada, Mexico. Yeah. Uh, and that was a, a really awesome experience. It's up a mountain and then down a mountain. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and at, at the bottom of the mountain, there are about 110 foot tall Corona bottles. <laughs> so, so yeah, we did that. And we would, uh, you know, we'd go up uh, to, to Idlewild. Up, uh, there was a tram that went up to the top of the mountain there in the desert. Played a lot of golf uh, while we was there. Oh, uh, that's fun. Okay. So you found, you found a different sort of outdoor activity to, to spend your time, your uh, leisure time doing. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so my kids were young, so I had a had a lot of daddy duty back uh, back in those yeah. days as yeah. well. Yeah, we know what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so at Devitt and Street, and then they were purchased. Is that right? Yeah. So so Bob, it was, it was uh, I want to say in nineteen might have been nineteen ninety ninety one or thereabouts. He uh, he ran the Marine Corps Marathon, and I think that was in October. And shortly, like within a month after that, he was diagnosed with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh, um, man. In February of the following year, he passed. I mean, it just took him that fast. So, oh. uh, yeah, and his, uh, his, his, you know, I'm not sure I'm not giving away any confidential information here, but the, the story goes, he, uh, his, his family did not want to stay in the business. So uh, they hired a uh, investment banker and sold the company to uh, Bovis, which was an international firm based in the UK. Okay. okay. And uh, so they owned uh, Lair McGovern up in New York. They owned a company in Chicago and uh, we were the third acquisition in the U S and, you know, they, they kind of left us alone for as, as long as I was there. And then um, after I left in, I think 99, a company called Lendlease out of uh, uh, Australia, I think purchased Bovis. How did that transition go from like a personal leader that you all felt very connected to, to a bigger company that management was probably a little bit different? Any big changes or, or not really? The entire company was, was just in shock when, when Bob passed. I mean, it, it, he was sort of the, the spiritual leader of the company that he was, he was that, that important to the organization. People move on. And uh, I do recall that, that Bovis must have seen something in in our organization and they they said hey this is working so they they really didn't mess around with the culture at all uh, I think you know they they brought their balance sheet and maybe some of their their business relationships and then you know we had a connection to New York and to Chicago so I think the synergy of, of being part of that organization probably in, enhanced our ability to acquire new and different work mm-hmm. it's, it's it's interesting I have two or three buddies that that are, are still in the business. And then uh, every year on the, the day of Bob's passing, somebody sends out a, an email saying, Hey man, just thinking about Bob. And this happened 25 years ago. Yeah, wow. yeah. And there's a, a big fraternity of guys that came out of McDivitt street that are CEOs, COOs uh, of, of really great companies around the country. We, we all still think about them. Yeah. Wow. Sounds like a special guy. Yeah. So then you were promoted to a VP of healthcare division at Bovis. Uh, can you talk about that transition from the, the kind of traveling uh, position to, to that? Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, 
that was a great time uh, in, in my life for, for, for a lot of reasons. It, it did get me and my family off the road. We finally bought a house mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, up in Charlotte and, uh, you know, my kids were still, you know, in, in elementary school. So it was, it was great for my wife and uh, my family. Now off the job sites and, and uh, had a, uh, a position, and I can't remember how somebody decided, hey, Mike, Neal, you're going to oversee. I think this is when they decided, well, we got to have a, a business unit leader for a healthcare group, one for industrial, one for commercial and one for education or whatever. So my job was to, to build the healthcare group. So, so I had a, a wingman, uh, a guy named Jeff Thompson, who was a phenomenal business development guy. And I, I hadn't done much business development, you know, so his, his whole deal said, Hey man, we eat what we kill. He, he had some pretty good relationships in the uh, healthcare space uh, in, in, in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, uh, uh, in, in Virginia. Pretty much every Monday morning, you know, we got uh, Jeff and I jumped in his car with five starch white shirts and uh, our, our best Brooks Brothers suits and went, went on the road yeah. uh, for three, four or five days at a time going to see all these hospital administrators and talking to them about uh, McDivitt Street and how we're the greatest healthcare construction company you'll ever want to do business with. And um, we together, I mean, it, it was it was phenomenal that the friendship and the synergy that developed between Jeff and I, but, you know, I kind of felt like I learned a lot about how to influence uh, a, a sale, how to, how, how to uh, build great relationships with my customers, because now I'm not, not just focused on one customer, I'm focused on, you know, several customers. We, we, we built a really nice business unit around, uh, you know, our whole, our little healthcare group. And, and we had, uh, I think we were one of the dominant players in that industry and, uh, you know, that entire Southeast U S region. I got to, uh, build a, a team of project managers and superintendents who, uh, I became very, very, you know, fond of, and, and you know, these guys, this, this was my family. You know? So this is really where I had my first real opportunity to, to understand what it took to build and grow a business, fine tune it, tweak it, you know, have full P and L responsibility, and uh, I, I was having a blast. That was probably one of the the highlights of my career. Building the hotels kind of taught you about how to manage a project P and L. Yep. And then this VP healthcare position kind of taught you about how to grow a business and look at a, at a broader business uh, unit. Yes, right? that's, that's exactly right. What makes a great healthcare construction company? I would say it's the same factors that, that go into making a, a great construction company. Number one, you have to have people who who understand the needs of their clients, right? And the healthcare business is 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 actually very unique. You know, there these these are people who have facilities that that help and serve people who have that are having families, delivering babies, have having horrible trauma going on in their life. So you have to a lot of our business was renovating existing buildings. And then some of them were building grand, brand new standalone hospitals. So first and foremost, you know, uh, understanding the needs of your clients and understanding what they go through every day and how, how you are a part of that and how you disrupt that in some ways. And, and specifically in a hospital situation where you're renovating two or three floors at a time adjacent to a surgery center or adjacent to a uh, imaging center, you work around them. They don't work around you. Right. And, and you have to maintain a sterile environment at all times. You have to coordinate your activities around procedures being had in the hospital. So that's the understanding part. And then I think the rest of it just comes back to the service part of making sure you have the right people on the job that understand healthcare construction. Uh, make sure that you are going and seeing them. I'm, I'm big on following up with my clients on a monthly basis and going and sit down and saying, hey, how, how's our team doing? It's, are, are we meeting your needs? Are, are, we, uh, are you hearing anything from your head nurses or from your physicians about anything that we can do to improve our business? Uh, how, can, how can we be less invasive or less disruptive to your day-to-day operation? It's really just understanding what providing a good service really means to that specific customer. Interesting. After Bovis, uh, what was your next job after that? So the final stop at Bovis was from the healthcare group in Charlotte to assuming responsibility for a, a an office that was not doing so well 
up in Richmond, Virginia. So okay. I'm not going to, I'm going to stop short of saying I, I cleaned up somebody else's mess, but I will say that I was asked to go up and uh, rebuild an office that was once one of their most important regional offices uh, in, in, in that part of the country. What did rebuilding it entail? Reputation uh, repair, because I, I think the folks that, that were my predecessors were maybe not quite as sensitive to the needs of their clients and they were hadn't delivered uh, on the promises that were made. So we, we had a little bit of a rough reputation in that, in that region. I think the subcontractors up there were maybe not treated as well as they should have been treated. So it was, it was almost uh, kind of reinventing that office, uh, taking a, a several year period to uh, reestablish ourselves in the community, uh, going back to some of the clients we had worked for in the past and, and, and talking about what didn't go right and, and begging them for a, an opportunity to get a second chance. Many of them did give us a second chance. Some of them, you know, say, hey, listen, we, we, we found other people to do business with and you're, you're not going to be one of them. But hey, listen, that, that happens. I mean, this, this is a, a tough business and, you know, no, again, it's not a assigning blame to anybody, but just sometimes, uh, you know, a fresh face uh, with a different perspective is just what a business needs, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Was that tiring to you or was it, was it, did you enjoy that part of the business? It, it was uh, kind of part of what have I, I, I asked for my whole career. I mean, most, a lot of people don't refuse to do the traveling gig. And if you, if you look, if I look back and I, I was always the guy that would be the stupid guy to raise my hand and say, yeah, I'll, I'll go do that. <laughs> because I, I was seeking out new opportunities, new way to test myself, new way to build, you know, my skills, because I, I, I assume that someday this is preparing me to do something bigger, something better, something more challenging. So anywhere you could run to to see and, and uh, unwind maybe mistakes that were made uh, is an opportunity to learn. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we, we left uh, Richmond in a, in a pretty good shape. Uh, I, I, I left there, uh, I want to say in 1998. And then I, uh, uh, I hadn't been home to Florida in 17 years. So I, uh, I had an opportunity to come down here and, and, and join a firm in, uh, in Miami that was a uh, developer builder and, and they specialized in these big high rise condominiums. They had a vacancy for a uh, vice president in construction. What was interesting to me was uh, the fact that, hey, these guys are developers. So I got uh, an opportunity to understand and, and, and be part of an organization that was doing real estate development, but we built our own stuff. Yeah, That was a, another way. Okay, now... Now I can take my construction skills, you know, stand next to the guy who's doing the development, learning how he goes and buys land, how they design buildings, you know, what makes the economics of a development deal uh, lucrative. I was exposed to high rise luxury condominium construction, which I had not done in the past. And uh, that was a place where I learned so many great lessons uh, that I think complemented my, my construction skills made me a better businessman. And ultimately, I, I ended up uh, together with uh, an, another guy buying that company. Let's talk a little bit about the move back to Florida in your personal life. Was, was, that like a, was that a goal that you had had all along is to get back to Florida? Or was that just something that happened to, to come about? It wasn't really a, a, a driving factor in, in me making that change. I, I felt that I had run my course at, at my previous company there, I, I didn't see any really new horizons for me at Bovis at, at the time. You know, there, I was I was hungry for something. You know, I'd, I'd been there a long time. I mean, uh, I, I was there a really long time. So I just felt like it was time for a a, a change and a, and a set of new challenges. And, and maybe that was just you know my career pattern where I'm always seeking new ways to challenge myself and new ways to grow, new ways to learn. It, it was a, a, a lot of mixed blessings involved in coming back to Florida. Number one, it was uh, uh, I got to spend time with my parents who were, you know, pretty late in their stage of life. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I was living very close to my mom and my dad. So I got to stop by their house every morning and have breakfast with them. And uh, it was it was probably some of the greatest time that I ever got to catch up with my mom and dad later in life. And, uh, mm. you know, got to 
tell them about what I was doing and uh, learn more about you know how they were doing and just have some great conversations, great time with uh, with family. And uh, at the same time, uh, on a personal basis, you know, it, it was kind of nice to be back in Florida. You know, I mean, it, it's when you're gone for a long time, you come back down here and you all these old memories about fishing and being being near the water, you know, kind of come rushing back to you. And it's uh, once I got back here, I, I, I kind of felt like, man, I'm back home. Mm hmm. OK, so you start with this firm. You guys do these like high rise luxury condominiums. Yes. And then there's an ownership situation where they're they're wanting to exit the business. And then you and a partner decide to make an offer for it. How, do, how does that come about? And um, can you walk us through some of that? Story? I, I will preface uh, this, this entire story by telling you, I think it's, it was just one of those rare, very rare things that, that happen in somebody's life where you're in the right place at the right time. Huh. Yeah. Uh, Cause it, it doesn't happen very often, but in, in retrospect, I, th I thought about this a little bit, not too long ago, but this was in 2003 about three years prior to the Great Recession. Right, right. This Canadian parent who had been in Florida for a long time doing this high rise, very risky high rise residential condominium development and construction, somehow for some reason, and you know, and you know there's a reason, decide, you know, they they want to exit the Florida market or maybe reinvent that business model down there to go from high rise construction to single family homes which was never going to happen. The president of our company and myself, you know, who, who had become ultimately became partners in the business together, you know, we were kind of thinking, wow, I mean, are they going to just close this thing down? Uh, you know, what's our exit strategy? We actually uh, had the presence of mind and, and, and good fortune to speak to a number of folks who I'll just call them great business advice type people who were in the real estate industry down here. And, and one of them just said, you know what, why don't you guys just make them an offer to buy them out? I mean, they, they, they know everything, you know, okay. They, 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 there's a reason yeah. why they want to get out. And I don't think anybody could have foreseen the, the great recession coming, but there were, there was some very light chatter about the market is oversupplied. There's too much this, there's too much condominium inventory growing down here. And what's that going to look like in four or five years? You know, we weren't worried about that. But, you know, we were actually, we we're really more like worried about what are we going to do next as, as, as people? What's my next gig going to be? Yeah, right. <laughs> we, we mustered up a little bit of courage and we, we, we went back to our office one afternoon and uh, got the CEO of uh, the, the firm on the phone. He was up in Toronto and we just said, Hey, listen, you know, we, we've heard you, we heard your, you know, your idea about trying to, to wind down the high rise residential and try to find single family tracts of land out here where we're competing against Lennar, GL Homes, all the national home building firms. We don't have a chance. We don't have a chance of being successful in that, in that venue. We don't have the skill set. We don't have the knowledge. We don't have the people. So we're thinking, just thinking maybe here's, here's our idea for you. Why don't you allow us to buy this business unit down here? That will give you an exit. We had no idea what we were talking about. <laughs> so, so the phone got quiet for about, it felt like for five minutes, it must've been maybe 30 seconds. And this guy, he, he says, why don't you guys fly up to Toronto tomorrow? Let's, let's, let's spitball some ideas. Yeah, that's and, and we're going, Oh God. So we jumped on a plane, went up to Toronto and, and uh, we, we sat down with this guy and he, this is, I mean, this is a brilliant guy. He has a big wad of recycled papers and, you know, he, he's scribbling down all these ideas. He's talking about this. Why don't we do this? Why don't you and you and Al buy this business for us? And it was for a ridiculously low number. It, it was a big number to me and big number to Al, but in, in retrospect, it was a ridiculously low number. Yeah. We will stay in. We had two more 30 story towers to complete. He goes, we'll stay in as your equity and your loan guarantee guys. You can earn some some really nice fees on that. And then you guys can go launch. You know, we've been trying to launch, you know, take our, our construction company and build for third party clients, which we never were able to do uh, under the previous deal. Right. Long story short, it was probably the best thing that could ever happen to two, you know, Florida rednecks uh, put us in a position of, of owning our own company, both of us for the first time in our lives. 
being in position to make a, a, a great living. We already had a great brand. So it wasn't like we were a startup. We were already one of the best regarded firms in South Florida. Now, by the way, I could build for other other developers. Right. Yeah. So, our, so our construction business just exploded. We had two great 30-story towers going on under in, in, down in, in, in Aventura, Florida. Uh, another two and a half years of business out ahead of us. And man, it was it was a very magical thing. Uh, and and uh, you know, I just remember back how how nervous we were the day we made the call, and how elated we were on the plane coming back. Yeah, yeah. you had some mechanics you had to kind of work out. Did you have to to get a loan to do the buyout, or did they kind of allow you to finance it over some of the fees that you were going to get? Yeah, there there wasn't the a lot of leverage in the deal. Yeah, some of the there's a little bit of an earnout you know, through some of the development fees. Uh, there was a, a, a uncomfortably large check that each of us had to write uh, going going into it. You know, we, yeah, uh, yeah. we mortgaged, mortgaged our kids, uh, put our homes up on the auction block. Uh, they wanted out bad enough to make us a a, a fair deal that was a, a you know walk away win win for them. They yeah. they were publicly traded company. They didn't want the exposure to the South Florida condo market, and I. Thinking back, I believe that these guys saw the recession coming. Yeah, I, I really do. I, I I think these guys are smart enough to to have a ton of Harvard MBAs working for them. You know, market analysts, and and they were a large national home building company, so they knew something that or believed something about two to three years earlier than most people were willing to to say. Yeah, that this thing's going to really turn ugly. Yeah, hmm. oh, that's interesting. Eric here. We hope you're enjoying our podcast with Mike Neal. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe, share it with someone you know, or leave us a review. If you know a CEO that would like to be on our show, send me an email at eric at conversationsaroundthecorner.com. Now back to our conversation with Mike. You and Al, that's it, that was your partner's name, right? Yeah, yeah. Was it a pretty natural partnership? Did you guys work well together? Or was it just kind of the circumstances that he had this position and you had this other position that like, made sense to be together? Well, we were, we became uh, fishing buddies and he was a guy who taught me, got me into fly fishing. So okay. we had a better relationship we that we had with our wives. I think. <laughs> but, uh, we never had a disagreement. We didn't, we didn't agree on everything, but we each had very specific parts of the business that we were responsible for, for, for dealing with. So he was, he, he, he's more of a CPA development guy with a lot of development experience. Uh, he, he, he was into the sales and marketing of the, of the, of the units. Uh, he was a guy who was talking to the banks about getting loans. And, and I was really pretty much mostly on the construction side of the business, overseeing all our construction activities. And then, you know, all major decisions in the business, you know, we would sit down daily and talk about, okay, yeah, we're going to go buy this piece of land or we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And in fact, you know, we're, we're still friends today. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It sounds like a, that sounds like a great opportunity and uh good timing. And, and so, so let's walk, let's walk through after that. So you, you do the, the next couple jobs and then you're like, all right, we can start selling into yep. to third party. And was that a whole new thing for you too? Or was that a pretty natural? Shift? Well, yeah, it was, it was the stuff that I was doing back at uh, my, my old job, right? right. Uh, it was out, out selling new work, acquiring new clients. So 2003, uh, January 1st, 2003 was the, the official date that we drove the new company off the lot. It was our company legally. And, uh, you know, we did a press release and then within one to two weeks, uh, I was being inundated with, I mean, there was so many new condominiums being developed and planned. Really? And, and frankly, there was, there was a shortage of contractors. So, I mean, I had work falling out of the sky uh, from 2003, 2000, all, all the way through 2006, four years of, you know, just having so many great opportunities. And we were, you know, we were building some of the largest, you know, 50, 60 story towers uh, along Miami Beach. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, I, I looked up some of those facilities that you guys built. So like the, the yeah. Artec and the Jade Ocean. Yeah, yeah. Those are like big high status buildings. And yes, did they yes. come with unique challenges to them? I can't say that they they were unexpected challenges. I mean, the you know, the thing uh, maybe on the, for example, on Jade Ocean, 
you have to deal with settlement. So we, we drive piles down 150 feet into the ground and these engineers calculate the estimated settlement is going to be, let's say, five to seven inches. Right. We, we have to hold off on building the adjacent parking deck until the, the building fully settles. And sometimes, uh, thank God it didn't really happen on our job, but uh, we were a little worried that the building was going to settle more than it expected to because the, it was settling faster than expected at, at, at first, but then it, then it slowed down and finally stopped. But, you know, the challenges in South Florida, uh, you know, we deal with hurricanes, uh, you know, bad weather, you know, seasonal type things. But there, you know, there was really nothing that comes to mind at the moment that, that I can tell you an exhilarating story about. Yeah. But it, they both were in tr- tremendously successful projects. Can you describe the moment when you guys first realized or thought to yourselves, uh oh, the construction's kind of drying up here before the Great Recession? Yeah. And, and it, it hit first in our de- new development side where, you know, we, uh, we had made a decision because we, we were a little nervous about the, the high rise condominium market. So we, we kind of steered the, the business, the development side of the business more into the three story garden style, uh, walk up townhome communities. Yeah. Okay. So we had, we had two, two pretty nice townhome communities going and uh, sales were, you know, off the chart, man. We were just going, oh my God, I can't believe how, how, how good we are. <laughs> but, you know, these are our first standalone development deals and man, there, I mean, people are lining up to buy them. And then I just remember Al coming back like two, two weekends and on Monday morning and we we're having our, you know, our pipeline report and our, you know, status report. He goes, man, the sales centers, there's nobody coming in. Hmm. People are freaking out. And I go, oh yeah, it'll, it'll get better. It'll, you know, don't worry. And then I started seeing uh, a, a good bit of slowdown on the new opportunities coming in on the construction side. Thank God we had three or four really large projects going that, that probably had one to two years to complete. So we we still had a lot of you know income coming in, but uh, I mean the the development side it came to a screeching halt. Then bad news feeds feeds on itself, and uh, all of a sudden you 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 know every Monday morning the, the the South Florida Business Journal, the Miami Herald, we go, oh man, you know, overbuilt economy, you know, the buyers are walking away, you know, instead of closing on their units, they're, they're, they're leaving their deposits on the table, they're walking away. And it just became a cascading effect of more bad news begets more bad news. And so we're, we're sitting on two pretty significant projects uh, that we started. We've already broke ground on, we're, but we're still selling. Uh, and then all of a sudden, nobody's buying the rest of the rest of the units. Mm-hmm. So what we ultimately, you know, I think we we wrote it out for about a year, and and you know, at this point in time, no new construction sales. So at, at this point in time, we we kind of said we got two choices here. We could continue, you know, we had a I want to tell you about a twenty million dollar year G and A nut. We had a lot of employees. We had already gone through one round of, uh, you know, salary cuts, and we kind of came to terms with the fact that this recession was going to be a really, really bad recession for an indeterminable amount of time. So we we made a decision to close the company. Yeah, wow. So we we had to go back to our banks, uh, do workouts with the banks. We you know we you know we didn't have enough sales to pay the construction loan. So we these are banks that we had been borrowing from for many years actually before I got there and Al had great relationships with them. They understood. We settled up with the banks, the, the real estate, you know, went into uh, receivership and then we finished all of our construction projects, told everybody this is uh, the end of the dynasty. I, I retired, I want to say uh, right about 2009 when we finished our last project. Uh, Al and I kind of took the you know, what cash we had left, which was uh, enough to, you know, retire on. And uh, I went down to my house in the Keys and fished my tail off for, for two years. And then uh, 2011, I uh, had an opportunity to, to come here to cast. When you look back on uh, some of like the finance stories around the recession and everything, and you tie it back to your business experience, you, and you watch like a movie, you ever seen the movie, The Big Short? Yeah, yep. Do you end up having just a, a perspective on that that is, you think, different from the average person's because of how it affected you? Or 
No, no, I don't. I mean, I think I think we are right in the middle of it, and and it was uh, I think it was a problem that that had a lot of different dimensions to it. Uh, I think the the lending environment was reckless. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that there were a lot of people who, when you go into a restaurant and your waitress is flipping condos, uh, making you know eight bucks an hour, and she's she she saying, "Yeah, I just bought a new condo contract, and I'm going to flip it." You I mean when people? Yeah. I mean that that was rampant, rampant yeah. down here. Huh. Yeah, especially that area. Oh yeah. So, I mean, listen, banks got annihilated. A lot of people lost everything they had. I think that, you know, if you look at why the multifamily space is uh, so strong today, I think a lot of the people who are renting now are either people who whose credit was decimated because they were living beyond their means and they couldn't uh, make their mortgage payments, or they are kids who saw their parents lose everything they had, and, and they're deathly afraid to buy a house, right? Yeah. I think the good news is, Banks are smarter. I'm spending a lot. I spend a lot of time with my my customers, and I, I see how hard it is to get a construction loan now. It's uh, I mean there are so many boxes that need to be checked. I mean people are underwriting deals way way more conservatively and and properly, and and making sure they're not lending money to somebody who doesn't have the wherewithal to get a deal done. So you think we we've generally solved a lot of the problems. I think so. I, I really do. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I look at where we are in this cycle right now. And if we didn't do all the things post the Great Recession that we did, if we just allowed those same policies to continue, I don't think we would have this kind of uh, still have pretty strong tailwinds in, in the economy down here in South Florida. The lending environment is, is it's not easy to get a loan, but people are still writing construction loans for big construction projects down here. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So, so you fished a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think one year, one of those two years I fished over 200 days. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, you've, you've been out fishing much yet this summer? Gotten a good, good time out there on the water? I've had a, a, not a great, uh, season this summer. I've, I've been tarpon fishing several days and just, uh, have not caught the, the quantity of fish that I've, typically I'm accustomed to. Okay. And I can't explain to you why I, I thought, uh, I think, I think I'm fishing very well, but, uh, there are certain conditions where fish just don't want to eat. And if they're spawning or if they're thinking about other, uh, other things in their lives, but, uh, these, these were not friendly fish that I encountered this year. And, uh, I just put my, my fly rods away. I'm going to go get them next year. Oh, really? So how, uh, is there, what's the window that you normally try to fish in? So um, I don't know how much you know about Florida. So we have a, a migration. The tarpon start migrating down south a, along the Atlantic coastline, um, typically starting in May, uh, April and May of the year. Okay. And, and so we typically get them uh, in, in pretty good quantities migrating on the ocean May, June, and July. Those are the, I call that the prime time to catch them along the ocean. And it's, it's, it's just an exciting, exciting venue. It's you, you and your guide on a, on a little 17 foot skiff. You're, you're out there and it, all, all this fly fishing stuff that we do here is, is all visual, very, uh, you know, it's called sight fishing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you, you've got a lava artificial fly out in front of a 150 pound fish and get it literally, you know, two to three feet away from his face. And if you, you know, strip just the right way and get the fish excited, he'll, He'll open his mouth and just then it's then it's game on, you know. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, I think you mentioned in your bio you got you kind of got your son into fishing too, so it's something you guys get to do together. Yeah, you know, going through high school, he didn't he he really wasn't into fishing the same way I was. I mean, I've been a kind of a freak about it uh, almost all my life. My daughter is like hardcore; she'll go out and. 10 to 12 foot seas with me and sailfish. Oh, that's great. Yeah. She's, she's a maniac, but my son just didn't have a lot of interest. And once he, 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 you know, he graduated from college, uh, moves away up to move first up to New Orleans. And then now he's in Houston. I typically go up to Venice, Louisiana every year. And and in the wintertime, the big redfish come in. So I invited him out and, uh, that this was going back six, seven years ago. And he finally caught his first big redfish on fly. He's now he's, uh, 
he's an addict. And then he said, dad, I want to catch a bonefish on fly. So we flew over to, uh, the Abacos, uh, in, in, uh, this, this past spring. Okay. He, he caught his first bonefish on fly there. And we stayed at this amazing lodge called the, uh, Delphi Lodge. And there's all these hardcore fly fishing around there. So he, he felt the camaraderie of all the, sure. the guys, so, you know, come in after a hard day and you start drinking some good rum and telling lies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> telling fishing stories. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, uh, uh, after he goes, dad, I got to catch a tarpon now. So we, we went down to the Isla Mirada and fished, um, Early June, the weather was just horrific. We had three days of just deluge rains, but we got this one 20 minute, 30 minute window where there's a little hole in the clouds and the sun was able to hit the water and we could see the, a fish coming. Our guide said, Mike, he was up on the bow. He said, two o'clock, 50 feet, lob one out there fast, fast, fast. So he, he did. And the second the fly hit the water, the fish ate. Oh, oh wow. So he got, a, it was about 120 pound fish. He fought it for a good, you know, half hour and he, he, Wow. He left there a champion, man. It was, it was just <laughs> absolutely the greatest thing that being his father watching that happen. And he was, he was just thrilled about it. So he'll be back. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Those That's are awesome. Those are, those are fun stories, fun times to spend with family. Walk us through like a, uh, uh, like your fishing day for us. What time are you getting up? What do you do in, in prep? All right. All the, I want to hear a fishing day for you. All right. Well, we'll talk about a, uh, a, a fishing day in Isla Mirada. Yeah. How about that? Okay. So, uh, you know, up at five, I, uh, my guide uh, meets me at my dock at, you know, five thirty, six o'clock. Got my little lunch bag, uh, got my two or three fly rods with me and, uh, uh, we, we shove off and we head, uh, either out to the ocean if we're going to be ocean fishing for tarpon or bonefish, or we go way back in the, Everglades National Park or Flamingo, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, either tarpon, redfish, snook, uh, you know, you name it. You know, there's there's a lot of things that happen during a day uh, when you're sight fishing. So early in the morning, the uh, the sun is not quite at the right angle. So it's a little tougher to see uh, your fish. So you're, you know, you're fishing, looking at the top of the water for little rumbles, little pushes, little little signs that there may be a, a, a one fish or two or three fish sitting somewhere. And then, so we're, so we're, you know, again, we're really focused on sight fishing. So everything we do is to gear towards having the best visibility at, at the species you're trying to target. Right. And it's, it's not, it's not a random thing. So we, we typically say when we leave the dock, we're tarpon fishing. We're not looking or, or trying to catch any other type of fish. If we're going bone, bone fishing, same thing, uh, you know, where we're targeting bonefish and we stay pretty much hardcore on it all day long. You're out all day uh, on a little 17 foot skiff. Uh, you're you're in the sun, so you're you're covered up from head to toe, long pants, long sleeve shirt, hat, a mask on your face. So you're you're you know trying to protect yourself from the elements. I think the the neat thing about that is uh, the the relationship and the communication between the guide and the angler. You know, the guide is an extra set of eyes. So he's, he's really the guy who's trying to find the fish. There's some amazing guys down in, in the keys that they know what spot to be on, on a particular tide. Mm -hmm. You know, they know, they know we're, we're fishing this spot on an outgoing tide. Uh, we want to be on this spot on an early incoming tide. Uh, we don't want to be at this spot until something's going on here. It's, it's really fishing tides. It's really knowing where to be, when to be there. And most of these guys know the fish are going to be swimming around that flat over there because the water's low. So they have to go around this, this little crest on the flat. So they're going to be coming right around there and straight into the bow of the boat. Huh. So that's where, that's where you need to be really paying attention. That's how kind of scientific it it, it, it is. You know, the guide will, you know, the communication is, you know, he, he, he will tell you, Okay, Mike, I got fish coming at uh, two o'clock, you know, 75 feet. A lot of times he'll say, you know, just hold off. Don't cast yet. I want, I want to see what these fish do. Before. I don't want you to have to recast. We're going to make one cast at 50 foot. It's got to land in the right spot. And then when your fly lands, sometimes it's really hard for the angler to see the fly. So the guide will start saying, okay, strip faster, 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 slower, slower, stop. And then he'll, he'll say he ate it. <laughs> and that's when you do a nice I set it set the hook. That's right. Yeah. Did you always take the same guide or did you try out different people? I have three or four guides that I've, uh, I have fished with 
Um, one of them was a guy that I fished a lot of uh, bonefish tournaments together with. And it, he was a guy I probably fished with most during the period where I was retired. Okay. You know, he, he got real famous and <laughs> he, he, I don't know if you, there's a show called Silver Kings. If you get a chance to watch it, you'll, you'll, that's the whole, yeah. okay. the whole deal about tarpon fishing. So his name, he, he's a great young guy uh, named Jared Raskob. So he and I, you know, it's, we're still friends, but I have another one or two guys that I'm fishing more regularly with. Uh, uh, one guy's more of a tarpon guy. The other guy's more of a bonefish guy. I'm, I'm picky about him because, you know, the more you fish with the same guy, the better you get. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's how that goes. Are you particular about your gear? My wife thinks I am. Because <laughs> there's, there's nothing that I don't have. And I, and I probably have more fly rods and, and more flies uh, that I'll ever be able to use in, the, in three lifetimes. It's actually, it's, it's actually embarrassing <laughs> if, you, if you saw how much stuff I have. What's your favorite everyday grab and go combination rod and reel? Well, again, that's very specific to, to what you are fishing for, but I'm a, uh, my, my go-to reel manufacturer, I'm a, is, is, is a reel made by a company actually in Delray beach called t reels. Okay. You know, for trout guys, uh, like yourself, you know, probably can get a four or five weight made by t Okay. So, you know, I mean, I fish pri- primarily a nine weight for bonefish and, and, and permit a 10 weight for permit and small tarp and then the 12, 12 weight for, for big tarp. Okay. okay. Wow. And then my, my go-to rods are, are G Loomis, you know, cross current. Uh, I went on a trip to uh, Belize recently. It was an Orvis sponsor trip. Okay. And somehow I ended up with two free uh, new Orvis Helios uh, rods that are actually, I've been using them a lot. They're fantastic. So they stand up to, to your, uh, your standards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what my standards are, but they, you know, I, I they, the, the feel, the, I mean, fly fishing is all about the feel, right? It's, it's, it's just how that rod feels in your hand, how, how, how fast it, it shoots the line. So, uh, they've, they've got it figured out pretty, pretty well. Oh, that's awesome. So it sounds like you're having a great time during retirement, but then you end up going back to work. How did, uh, how'd that happen? Boy, I wish I could figure that out. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't like I had made the decision to retire because I wanted to. It was, sure. it was, uh, it was, it was really a situational and, and, and quite unfortunate reason to have to do that. We did it intelligently. We, 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 you know, we didn't suffer in retirement, which was, which was good. We, we got to travel and have some fun. Actually, the cast is an affiliate of a uh, development company based in West Palm Beach called Coulter. Okay. Back in 2001, we got a call from, uh, this, this was back when we were still owned by Brookfield Properties, uh, the, the company we bought. Uh, was owned by a, a big publicly traded company called Brookfield based in Toronto. And, and they called us up and um, said, hey, listen, we got a, we got a guy who's a Toronto-based guy. He's, he's relocating his entire development operation to West Palm Beach. Very, very strong, wealthy family that you know, had a lot of real estate interests in Toronto. They're moving to West Palm Beach and they want to start doing some development down there. And they would like to have a joint venture partner. And so we went and met with them. We formed a joint venture and uh, we were going to co-develop uh, a big condo in downtown West Palm Beach with Coulter. And then Costco and my company was going to build it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we worked on that deal together with them for a year, did all the underwriting, got the documents, all the construction plans done. And then 9-11 happened. Mm. Oh. The bad news is Brookfield owns most of the property around the World Trade Center. Okay. So probably two or three days later, we get a call from the guys in Toronto saying, man, we're, we're pulling the plug on uh, West Palm. Yeah. We were, we were vastly disappointed, but, you know, I mean, it was hard to, uh, that was such a tragic time in, in America and, uh, you know, everybody's heads were spinning. But, uh, you know, Brookfield just had too many distractions in New York to, to worry about how they were, you know, what they were going to do and what the market was going to look like post 9-11. So we pulled out. Coulter ended up doing the deal on their own. Through that year of collaborating with them, I, I became pretty good friends with uh, Bobby, who, who owns Coulter. We we stayed in touch literally after you know after that whole episode. So I'd come up and meet him, have lunch with him every now and again. And so I get a call. I'm down in the Keys. I just got back in from fishing. 
<laughs> and, and I get a call from Bobby. He goes, Hey man, uh, when, when are we having lunch? When you, when you, uh, what are you doing? I go, I'm, I'm, I'm retired, dude. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm kind of, kind of having a pretty good time. And the reality was I was, I was anxious. Uh, I, I felt like I needed to do something more than what I was doing. And, uh, felt like I had, had a few good years left in me. Drove all the way from Island Rod up to West Palm Beach, had a nice lunch with him. We talked about family, friends, blah, 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 blah. Not once did he say anything about why he called me. Uh, you know, I just thought it was a social call, to be honest with you. Yeah. So I, I went back down to Island Rod, and about a week later, he calls me and goes, oh, I forgot to ask you something. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, you know, you know, you know, I have this little construction company, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a fledgling little business, and... Uh, I feel like the market's getting better and, uh, you know, I'd like to talk to you about coming in as a partner with me. You forgot to ask that <laughs> oh, oh, during our lunch because I'm not driving back up here. We're going to have this conversation on the phone. And, uh, you know, he laid it out again, you know, the, the part of me that that's attracted to, uh, a challenge. And, you know, here, he, I, you know, I kind of found the stats on the company. I go, what, you know, how big is the company? Oh, well, we're doing about 25, 30 million a year, you know, um, it's been real bumpy and choppy, but these guys are hanging on for dear life, you know, because Coulter wasn't even developing anything at that time. You know, this, this entity was literally surviving on work that Coulter wasn't doing, which is a bunch of small country club jobs, a couple little select service hotels. Long story short, I bit. <laughs> I wrote yet another big check that I didn't want to write. To He says, listen, man, you're going to be my partner. You're going to be my partner. You you got to have some serious skin in the game. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I uh, talked to my financial advisor and he told me I was an absolute moron. Yeah. Uh, he goes, dude, you're on a fixed income. You are a retiree. You don't have, you don't want to be doing this. And I said, yeah, I do. We're doing yeah. it. We, uh, we came to terms and uh, I think I started on um, October 2011, and uh, I, I met uh, the the team, and uh, we we sat down and just we plotted, a, created a little bit of a blueprint, some missions, vision, values, and all that stuff uh, to to say, you know, what do we want to look like when we grow up? And uh, so we we set a put some kind of a rudimentary business strategy together, and uh, here we are in 2019, uh, you know, pretty well established firm doing uh, you know over a half a billion dollars a year. Oh wow. If you look at your career history as kind of like a training ground for then what you've done at Cast, which which position best gave you the skills to do what you've done? Once I got to Charlotte and and was doing more of a formal heading up the healthcare efforts, yeah, because so much of what of what I do today is is business development, uh, it's relationship building, it's team building, trying to forecast where we're going to be in a, in a, in a year or two years or five years. It's, it's something that I, I, I rely so heavily on other people that I'm, I'm develop. you know, I focus a lot on developing people and talent acquisition. So that, that's probably the most important part, but, uh, you know, frankly, it's a, um, I think it's a culmination of, of a lot of things, you know, of, of being like every day of my entire career, right? Because I still, I still have to, you know, have a sensibility about how to build, but I, I really don't get too deeply into that. I've got very strong people who are far better than it than I am. But, you know, you have to know your industry. Throughout your entire career, you've been promoted, you've moved around, you've been in several leadership positions, you end up CEO. If you had a young guy just starting in the construction industry who said, I want to get into this role, I want to get into a leadership role, what advice would you give him? What track would you say, hey, this is really the track you should head down. These are the experiences you should look for. What would you tell them? Well, I, I would tell them first and foremost that you have to be incredibly committed. If you, if you want to be sitting behind my desk someday, you have to be 100% all in and you know, failure is not an option. And you have to ask yourself, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice to get here? Because this is not a an easy job by, by any means. One, once upon a time, a, 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 I asked that same question and I remember, I can't remember who it was that answered it for me, but they drew sort of like a peacock tail with, you know, all the, the peacock feathers. And on the far left, 
the first feather on the left was uh, he wrote the word technical in it. He said, mm. this is this is where you start your career. You, you have to learn all the technical aspects of the business. Uh, and then on a graduated basis, every feather further to the right involved more interface with people, mm -hmm. uh, leading teams, managing, you know, building relationships with architects and, 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 and uh, engineers. And then about halfway through now you're, you're, you're really starting to own client relationships and, and turning those a single client, you know, relationship with the client into a multiple building project building program. And then the further, further to the right, then, you know, you have to really understand the, you know, the P&L, the balance sheet, the income statement. How, how, how do you run a profitable business? You know, what do you do? And then and, and you got planning. So, and, and, and I would tell them, listen, it's taken me about 30 to 40 years to learn that. Yeah. Can you do it faster than me? I'm sure you're way smarter than I am. Um, I'm, I'm not the brightest uh, crayon in the box, but, but unless you're willing to sequentially learn all the different aspects of, of this business and, and of, of this industry, there, there, there are no shortcuts. Mm. Do you do any Bob Street type of things around the office these days? Yeah, all the time. All the time. Yeah, we, uh, we, we have uh, a minimum of you know, 10 to 12 employee events every year. Uh, we have a crazy lavish Christmas party that is a, a absolute blast. And, uh, somehow I, uh, me and my wife end up dancing all night long uh, and, and, and she goes, we've, we've got to stop this someday. You know, we, we're, we're really embarrassing. Our, the music has changed from the temptations to, uh, 50 cent. <laughs> you don't have those kinds of moves anymore. And I go, yeah, you're right. We're going to have to find a, find some stand-ins or stunt doubles there someday. <laughs> You know, we have a, 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 a annual, a great employee picnic uh, that's kind of back to back with a, a massive company meeting where we bring every employee over here and we try to communicate. You know, it's, it's a whole one day deal of uh, in, in a big uh, convention center where, you know, it's a, a lot of recognition, bring in big time guest speakers. I don't know if you've heard of Jocko Willink. Mm. No, you know, ex extreme ownership. Oh my God. You got to check him out. He, okay. he does, he does podcasts, but it's uh, he's written a couple of books, people of that stature. We, we got Jocko when he was first getting popular. So we got him for the, the not too famous rate. I, I couldn't afford to have him in here today. Check him out. All right. It's, it's, it's a way to communicate, you know, the vision, the mission and values multiple times a year through you know, we do top golf. We we go to these things. They have all these old warehouses here that they've converted into goat cart tracks and just crazy fun things for getting the C-suite people together with uh, all the people from the job sites. And, and uh, yeah. you know, I think that's resulted in us uh, continuously being recognized as one of the best places to work in Florida. I have seen that Jocko Willink guy's stuff. I just looked him up. Yeah, I've I've been on his like Twitter and his Instagram before. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, he's he's pretty pretty intense. So, where do you go from here? What's the plan over the next couple of years? Well, look, I'm uh, I'm 63 and I feel like I'm 33. So I've I still have uh, the same level of passion and. Uh, belief in, in what I do and what I bring to, to this company that I've ever had. Um, for the last four or five years, I've, I've identified a few folks here uh, that I think are capable of, of uh, stepping into my shoes. I've got one young man who I think is uh, probably two to three years away, but he's, I, I keep on dumping more and more responsibilities on him and he, and he's, he makes it look easy. Okay. And what is great about that is it, it allows me to focus less on day-to-day -day issues and, and trying to look out over the horizon to see, is there, is there another way for us to get better at what we do? Is there some, you know, can we, can we maybe increase our geographic footprint, uh, you know, taking our business outside of Florida making the company more valuable, uh, providing opportunities for, for more people to, to grow from within our company. So I'm able to, you know, he's, he's been a huge factor in freeing me up to, to be a better CEO uh, while training him and grooming him to be the CEO that uh, I know he's going to be when, when I step down. 
That's great. Uh, we got two more quick sections here, but that kind of we kind of covered almost everything we had in the timeline chronology area. So we do one section that we give you a quick topic or a word, and you tell us if you think it's overrated and underrated. Maybe a quick word or two on why. Okay. All right. Overrated, underrated carbon bike frames. Hmm. I'm not a uh, gadget guy at that level, but I, I my bike is a carbon frame bike. It's, it's super light. It's super high performance. Uh, so I'm going to say it's uh, underrated. Okay. Sometimes you get these people who are, are very particular about steel or titanium, especially if they've been biking for a long time. So uh, what, what do you ride? A Cervelo S5. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, overrated, underrated. Dell Brown's Merkin. Uh, well, listen, it, it stood the test of time. So I'd say it's under underrated. It's still catching, uh, still catching plenty of fish. Okay. Yeah. I use it. I use it actually. Okay. I, uh, I was reading that some people say it made a permit catchable to some people that it wasn't catchable before. I would tell you that's, that's a true story. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Overrated, underrated the breakers hotel. Wow. I would say it's underrated. It it may be one of the most fabulous places, uh, uh, hospitality venues in the world. Do you have a unique perspective on hospitality after being in the industry? Do you have preferences? Personally, I, I like I like to stay at nice hotels, and, and when when we travel, my wife and I travel, we uh, kind of go to the the higher end of the spectrum. And I think we both feel that that's a luxury we've, we've worked hard all our life to earn. And, uh, I, th I think it makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last question in this section. Um, not really overrated, underrated, but since you're a big Florida history guy, do you have a favorite Henry Flagler story? I will tell you that my absolute favorite book, uh, is, is about Henry Flagler. It's called last train of paradise. It's, it's really, his life's history after leaving, you know, Standard Oil Company and how he's basically single-handedly changed the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. I recall one part of the book where they're talking about him trying to get the uh, Mary Brickle, who, who was one of the, I don't know, 10 residents of Miami, uh, tried to talk him into bringing the railroad to Miami and the, the banter back and forth between the two very stubborn, hard-headed people. Uh, uh, I guess it ultimately ended up with he agreed to bring the railroad down to Miami, and uh, he was that was the last step step of the uh, journey before heading down to the Florida Keys. And uh, which, which to me, that was a probably one of the most epic real estate development stories uh, of our lifetime. Huh. How different do you think real estate development is from those old kind of stories like that, or there's still some truth to how things are done? I'm going to speak from the private sector perspective, uh, which is really way more of what I prefer to be in than the, than the public sector. The thing that I don't think has changed is the tenacity and the willingness of men and women to take unbelievable risk to, to be a developer. I mean, the, most people have no idea of the risk involved in these massive real estate projects. I mean, it, you know, and it's cost many a man and a woman, a, a, you know, their, their entire life's fortune. So if you look back at uh, all the entrepreneurs of the 1920s and before that, uh, doing the same thing today, uh, the, these people are taking huge risks, putting all their marbles on the table, all, all in the name of real estate development. Maybe the big difference between then and now is that now there is so much more institutional equity, pension fund money private equity sharing in the risk, maybe people are not taking quite as much risk as they used to, but uh, it's, it's still a, a very risky business. Yeah. Do you think that the money not being so much personal money changes the decision making in the whole process? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, just to give you an example, I mean, if you were developing a multifamily project, you know, a rental project, and it's your money, are, are you going to kid yourself by trending your rents above, you know, underwriting your rents above what the current market is? Yeah, right. A lot of people do that, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, they do it with, with some level of justification. Well, we're trending them up because 
rent growth has been this and that and the other. But I mean, the reality is you don't know what rents are going to be tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of deals are are underwritten that way. It's not dishonest. You know, the only person you're kidding is yourself. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So what time do you wake up every day? 4.30. How many, how many hours a night do you sleep normally? About six. So are you, are you hitting, you're hitting the bike? You, you got a little warm-up routine you go through, or are you on the bike immediately after that? No, I, I, my feet on the floor, 10 minutes later, I'm on the bike. Wow. You kind of uh, buzz up and down like uh, like Ocean Boulevard or? Yeah, I live just north of Delray Beach. Uh, so I, I typically ride south to, to Boca Raton, uh, go seven and a half to, to 10 miles each, each direction. Okay. What's your uh, favorite restaurant? I like the restaurants in Delray Beach. So uh, I, I've got a, a place that we go to kind of probably way too much. It's a a little house just off Atlantic Avenue called Cina, C-E-N-A. Okay. And it's just a cozy little quaint Italian restaurant. And uh, they know me when I walk in and I get a good table every time. And it's, it's, it's a great place. What website do you visit every day that might be surprising? Uh, there's no surprise. I'm, I'm pretty boring in that regard. I, <laughs> I, I get up, uh, you know, when I get back from my bike ride, I go cool off and uh, I look at the Wall Street Journal and uh, that's about it. I keep asking that question and it, it never gets the kind of bite I, I think it should. <laughs> yeah. I, in my, in my mind, there's like quirky little, like there's no, there's no, uh, saltwater fishing forum that you, that you visit. All my fishing buddies post stuff, uh, and the guides that I, I fish with, they, I, I, I'm not proud of it, but I, ha- I have an Instagram account. Oh, you said, <laughs> and is, is your Instagram account full of pictures of guys holding up fish? I don't, I don't overdo it, but I have a couple of nice pictures. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Here's another question I have. You see guys taking these pictures with like their rod in their mouth, holding up the fish. Yeah. But this seems to be like a saltwater fly fishing thing unique to that. I feel like a lot of freshwater, you just see them kind of, I don't know, holding it to the side. Is that, uh, is that just a, an inside baseball thing with saltwater fly fishing? Yeah, I, I do it and I have done it. Uh, I, I don't take that many pictures anymore because I, I have plenty. I, I guess it's a way to, to, to say, yeah, I caught that on fly. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Right. Yeah. You got to get it in frame. <laughs> That's it. Yep. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. How about, uh, do you have a favorite quote, uh, that quote that you always kind of find yourself coming back to telling people all the time? The one that I, I, I kind of like a lot of two, um, one is, uh, Amat Victoria Karam that, uh, victory loves preparation. Okay. That's one I kind of, I shoot to my kids every now and again. I go, what's this all about, Dad? I go, you know, well, success doesn't happen by accident. And, and I try to you know, remind myself that all the hard work goes on behind the scenes. There's another great one that I like. It's uh, Ken Blanchard put this out there. I don't know how long ago, but it says, uh, profit is the applause you get for taking care of your customers. No, that's a good one. Yeah. And that's, that's really germane to us being in the service business, right? And if it's, if it's all about the buck all the time, you're not going to be doing a good job taking care of your customers. Uh, that's a good perspective. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Conversations Around the Corner, produced by Wallprotex, the designer and manufacturer of wall protection products for healthcare, hospitality, or any commercial building. Be sure to subscribe in iTunes or Stitcher and tune in next week where we will have another conversation around the corner.